Good evening. I'm Ann McLean from the library's music division, and I have the great pleasure of introducing to you Midori, visionary artist, global activist, and educator, and UN Global Messenger for Peace. and composer Tamar Diesendruck, whose Library of Congress commission, Unruly Strands, receives its world premiere tonight. <laughs> Welcome. We're very delighted tonight to present a concert that exactly fits our 2019-20 season theme of honoring, honoring extraordinary women performers and composers. And the program you chose, in fact, actually influenced and inspired us to think about developing this theme for the season. This was such a significant lineup of composers, Vivian Fung, Sophia Gubardulina, also a library commission, which we'd love to talk about, Olga Neuvert, and Frangis Ali. So we wanted to start by asking you, what was your thinking? How did you develop the program? So the idea behind this was that um, there was actually a particular request. Uh, there is no time commitment, but um, there was a particular request of putting together a program of uh, women composers. Um, and when that request came, and I was due for um, another series, I felt, of um, modern mm -hmm. music recital, I decided to put the two ideas together. And then, of course, um, it was a very interesting process. I didn't think that it was going to be this interesting. <laughs> and so I had a wonderful time doing a lot of research. And um, just to give a little bit of a background, um, one of the areas that I studied as a college student was gender studies. And so um, back then they still called it, they were just about to be really fully calling it gender studies. Still back then um, it was the women's studies. But um, I actually had wonderful professors who guided me and introduced me to uh, literature, uh, female writers, literature, and the whole movement that was going on at that time of really bringing um, the issues of gender inequality to light. And it was very, very interesting. And I read up on, well, I mean, the standard liter literature for gender studies back then. Um, and I'm sure it is still so today, from Simone de Beauvoir to, yeah, just, just many, many, uh, just lots of, lots of things. And of course, you know, that's the virtue of being in college. You get inundated with all the reading materials. <laughs> Contact. I mean, and I had a fascinating time, and so that was always sort of there in my background and in my back of my mind. Um, and and then there was this very very important line from a room with a view. Um, it says that women need space, women need role models, um, women need time, um, and women need a lot of different things that men all have uh, in order to write. And that was a message I got. And of course, we can see it's the same about every profession, including composers. And so when I started doing this research, it was very interesting because, um, first of all, just the way I see the trend of modern music is that we're really very much going away from the tradition of having multi-movement works. We don't have the three-movement sonata structure as much, or the four movement. Um, so, you know, we have short works or shorter works or very, very short works put together as a set. Um, so, you know, that already for me to discover some of this music and to, to start to put the program together was interesting. But then, of course, when I was concentrating more on really putting together a whole recital with female composers, um, it added a particular challenge. It's not that there aren't a lot of uh, compositions out there, of excellent compositions written by women. It's just that when you're restricting it to violin piano music, you're restricting it to the last 40 years or even less, um, something that actually fits together well within the recital program that offers contrast as well as cohesiveness, then you get rather limited. Um, and th that can be said, of course, about any any program that I have to put together to sure. have this cohesiveness as well as the contrast. And um, so it's always a challenge, but this was a particularly um, stimulating sort <laughs> of um, challenge that I had. And um, it was really 
for me, a very inspiring, a mind-opening sort of um, challenge. And the colors, you, colors and textures are extraordinary. They're so arresting in this program. The way the writing works for the violin and the piano, virtuosity is a theme, but not necessarily only, as Tamar was saying the other day, not in the traditional sense. There are many types of virtuosity required in this program and in these compositions. And I was thinking about the texture, particularly for, and timbre for Gubay Dulina, remarkable. Um, and they, she has such an ear for this and I was thinking too about um, her comments about the dancer on a tightrope and, and the metaphor uh, and the just the whole way that she thinks of this as a spiritual, my, my colleague says rigorous but rhapsodic. But it's, it's really, I'm so pleased you're playing this because it, it's our, as I said, our commission and we're so proud of it. How, what are your feelings now that you've had a chance to work on it? Had you played it before? Um, I knew of the piece for a long time, of course, and this is a classic within the canon, I feel. Um, so, you know, I knew about the piece um, for a long time, and I think it was written in the mid-90s, that's when they commissioned mm -hmm. the premiere, was. And it's very, actually, popular within the modern... Um, it's done a lot. Yeah, it's Sur done a lot. Surprising. So, um, but, you know, it's just every time I rehearse it, every time I study, I, I learn it, it's a discovery, and that there seems to be such freedom, but also such clear, clear um, direction from the composer. Um, and it's such a fantastic combination of sounds. Both Gubay Lina and Neuvers, they, I think in terms of using extended technique, and Alizade mm -hmm. to a mm -hmm. certain extent too. Um, Alizade mostly in the piano, mm -hmm. but um, the idea of um, extended technique, how to produce sound, what kind of sound is in the imagination, and then the creativity it takes to actually write it on paper, mm -hmm. and actually the inspiration that the performers have to receive in order to now bring these sounds, these symbols that's on paper to life. Uh, it, it's a multi-process, multi-step process, which um, is absolutely fantastic, and the discovery doesn't end. <laughs> yeah, and um, the whole idea of, you know, what music can be, this keeps expanding, and what sound means, what sound can do, what, um, you know, um, what kind of sort of influence that the sound could have on each individual listener. Mm -hmm. Of course, one can say this about any piece of music, any wonderful music, any great music, but how it actually affects each one of us, I think this vocabulary is definitely growing. She, in terms of the, her own comment about this, she talks about the title. I found this in her file today. She says the title, and since part of this is in your program, the title stems from a desire to break away from the confines of everyday life. It's inevitably associated with risk and danger. The desire to take flight for the exhilaration of movement, of dance, of ecstatic virtuosity. A person dancing on a tightrope is also a metaphor for this opposition, life as risk and art as flight into another existence. Very powerful piece that you'll be playing and powerful words. She's a remarkable person and she uh, talks a lot in her writing about her religious belief and how that has strongly influenced her, her music. Um, and I know that we met her when she had the premiere. She's an extremely modest, reserved, quiet person. But you feel a charge almost coming from her when you're talking. Totally seems very serious. And yet she has humor. And humor is reflected in the piece, too. There are moments like that in the, in the texture. So anyway, I'm just so glad that you have this piece. It's, um, but back to the extended techniques, that's another thing. Throughout the whole program, uh, and Tamar's piece certainly, and um, there's also a piece with an Ebo. There are not only extended techniques, but some tools. The, yeah, is it? Tour, yeah. This is my piano's class. The tours. Yes. <laughs> yeah. Involved in this. Um, there are no toys in Tamara's piece. <laughs> there are no toys in Vivian Fung's piece. <laughs> uh, but there are toys in, um, in Gubay Lina's piece, uh, Neuvert and Alizada. And actually, I should uh, point out that Alizada is it's an original composition for the, the cello. 
and it's a it's a transposed um, mm -hmm. work for the violin, and so the 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 extent technique on the piano is what it was also on the cello. It's actually transcribed for the violin. So it's a little bit, you know, we have to uh, approach it with a slightly different idea for this. But um, no, in, in terms of the extended technique, we have things from um, playing on the other side of the bridge, uh, using the nail, mm -hmm. um, using it. So really, uh, extended technique in terms of expanding the way we use our instrument and our relationship, our physical uh, relationship to our instruments. And, um, you know, it's not just about just, you know, playing a, a little bit closer to the bridge or on the bridge or on the, um, on the, on the fingerboard. But, um, yeah, these, um, some of the extended technique, uh, they go far and beyond. <laughs> And there is this amazing sound. I came into the rehearsal in Ieva. And by the way, the pianist tonight is extremely fine. Ieva Jokuba Vichute. Um, you're you're going to hear the explosion from these two women. is amazing. Uh, but she had this, there was this deep hum, a very gorgeous hum. And I was thinking, is the air conditioning gone bad? What's happening? You know, and it was a little tool. Evo, what, is, yeah. what is that? Ievo actually is not a bow. <laughs> it's a little device that uh, one puts on the string inside the piano, and it's battery operated, I'm sorry. Um, it's not something so natural, but it's battery operated. You put it on the, on the string, of course it catches the vibration with the pedal yeah. of the string, and it's just to make this humming noise. Yeah, it's beautiful. It, it's kind of fascinating. You hear that actually in Neufert, just in case you're wondering which one you should be on the lookout for. Back to the Frangish Al Jadet. Um, she is a, a wonder. If you don't know any of her music, she's a beautiful composer too. Don't you, have you heard some of her music, Frangish Al Jadet? And this piece that Midori and Yeva are playing tonight, it's related to a Kamancha, right? Which is a one. Is it a Persian? fiddle with a bow. Yeah, in the area. She's from Azerbaijan yeah. and so she's very um, interested and very involved in bringing the sounds of her, um, sounds of the music of her background into the compositions. And this was originally written, as I said, the cello and piano, but piano not as we normally think about playing mm -hmm. the piano but more like plucking and slapping the piano. Uh, but um, it's, um, it's a very festive work uh, towards the end. Of course, we put it at the end of the evening, and there's a lot of dance in it. There's, it's haunting at first, uh, perhaps. Um, and um, it's very evocative of many, many sort of imaginative scenes. You know, we, we know that your time is limited tonight, and uh, Tamara and I are going to continue talking about your piece and so on. There are just so many things we'd love to ask you about, like new projects, and of course I know you're now at Curtis. Um, in terms of contemporary music, music like this, what are, how are you feeling about students learning it these days? What's your perspective on this, teaching, particularly the violin repertoire? Mm -hmm. In fact, I actually think it's extremely important that um, students are learning the music of, <coughs> excuse me, the music of our time. And in fact, I do insist very much, and the students are very eager. Um, mm -hmm. Sometimes, you know, students feel a little bit undirected and um, unguided when they try to tackle on modern music. But, you know, when we do it together, when we try to research together, when we try to discover things together, and when we make it into really a collaborative effort. And it's wonderful when we can get the composer involved as well. Um, but, um, you know, it's a process that we can learn so much from. And it's not just about learning the repertoire that are being written today, but we learn about what sound is about, what sound could be, what music could be. Mm -hmm. Um, and it really takes our imagination to a different level. Um, there, are, I think, for students who are just starting to learn modern music, of course, they have opportunities to work with their peer composers who are students. Mm -hmm. But I also work with them on the so-called standard modern music. 
uh, that are getting quite popular, like, like Lena's piece or a piece by Ulaslavsky or Adams, um, Hartke. Um, actually, Adams and Hartke are, I now realize, are both Library Congress commissions. Yeah. Um, and um, so there is sort of what we might call standards or what I feel might become standards. Um, and that I try to actually get them involved in those as well, rather than just working with their peer composers. Mm -hmm. And I also, with some of the students, encourage um, I, I encourage them to actually do an immersion for a limited period of time to do just one sort of period of music. It could be Baroque, and it could also be modern. Um, hmm. So I have students embarking on those projects. You know, it's interesting you mentioned the Baroque because we just had a group here last week, Quicksilver, whose violinist Robert Mealy was saying that he thinks of a Baroque as a second language. And he at Juilliard likes to have a class and to introduce many students who don't play this music a lot to take this course and learn to speak this language as well. We were just talking about that. Kazim Abdullah, my colleague, and I were talking to him about that. Um, back to this piece, for your piece tonight, um, we're so excited because this is also going to be heard not only tonight, but at Le Poisson Rouge, I understand, on Monday, and you're, you're going as well. This is so cool, I have to say, you know, it's, it's pretty neat to know that you're going to be, what else will be on that program? It's actually the same program, uh -huh. and we're taking Perfect. the program then next week to London as well. Wow! So, and they have a series going on at King's Place right now called uh, Venus Unplugged. Uh -huh. And so this also fit their theme, or I don't know if after they got the, this program, they decided to name this program. I, I don't know which, is, which came first, but um, yeah, so um, it actually worked out really well. And we're very excited. Um, you know, we have probably the oldest piece we have in the program is Alizade's uh -huh. Vegas. Um, and the newest, of course, is Tamar's. <laughs> and we have two pieces, um, sort of Russian composers. I mean, Neuvers is um, mm -hmm. Russian, Austrian, mm -hmm. and then, of course, Gubailina from the mid 90s. Yeah. And then we have Vivian's piece, which is from, I believe, from 2012. So this is so fantastic. It's a range. But the thing is, the range of styles we're going to hear is even more varied. Mm -hmm. You know, we're mm -hmm. talking, okay, 40 years. But no, I mean, when we think about 40 years, say, in the classical period, yeah. okay, we don't hear that much variety. And yeah. this is really exciting for me. Yeah. Yeah. And then, of course, the most interesting process in this whole idea of new music is that, well, Except for tomorrow's piece, I'm playing pieces that were already written and that have been premiered. And besides myself, there are others playing it, obviously. Yeah. But then with tomorrow's piece comes this opportunity mm -hmm. to give its first performance. And once I believe very much that once the first performance is given, then the piece actually then starts its own life. Mm -hmm. And it's just grown on its own. Um, it's almost like sort of just letting your child be. And without my doing anything to it, you know, at least as a performer, you know, just the piece grows and it's just to mature. And it's a fascinating sort of um, experience of watching this happen. And of course, you know, I've had the music, I got the first sort of um, draft in the summer from tomorrow of this piece. And since then, inside me, it's been growing. Mm -hmm. But now, after the premiere, it takes even a different step yeah. forward of a different kind of a growth, which I think is fascinating. I agree, and to watch it happen, and we had a nice conversation about this yesterday. Tomorrow was telling me about um, how you had met and worked on it together, and how you had the opportunity to finalize the score and go over the typos and you know the choreography of the piece and just learn woodshed it. I guess is that the thing, and you were saying it's a marathon for the for the two artists. That um, I think it is. <laughs> I, I, I don't know if they would. Uh, regard it as such, but it's um, it's a pretty hefty piece, and it is in one movement. As she said, these days people aren't really having, you know, the big powerful movement, the middle slow movement, maybe a scherzo, and then a, another pretty big movement, but that has a dance character or whatever. 
yeah, we just throw it all together and, um, in my case, dice it up. And um, you have to just concentrate. I, I think it's that's what makes it a marathon to me, that the level of concentration yeah. that I think it takes is uh, very... And, of course, it's virtuosic, but... Um, there's a kind of virtuosity of concentration, I think, that, that these people have that's amazing. But I also, well, first of all, I have to say that this is the longest piece on the program. So oh, it's okay, actually, yes. In that sense, it's, you know, it takes a lot of concentration. But, you know, it's, the, it's a new language. It was a new language for me because sure. I've never played anything of yours before. And to come to this, uh, it's a discovery, it's a new challenge, and of course it opens, any new challenge opens up my mind and, and gives me more ideas. Um, and it's an, a very exciting process. At one point, the piece starts to click you know, inside you. You feel like, oh, okay, this is what I want to do with this, rather than, okay, what does a composer want? That's the first process. And for me, it's very, very important as a player that I'm always in the service of the composer and the music. And I think this also is a little bit telling of the back and forth we had to do in terms of well, what did you really mean? Well, if I see this and this is what I understand the composer mm -hmm. to want to be, is that what you want? <laughs> and you know, I, I actually like being rather specific and yes. particular. Um, and going from trying to understand what it is, then of course, in this particular case, we have the advantage of technology. We happen to have the advantage of living in the same time mm -hmm. and to be able to have this conversation. But with, a, with, with most of the things that I play, <laughs> um, the majority of the repertoire that we have still, I don't get to talk to the composer. And so I, this is my thing with my music, with my score. What does the composer want? I have to try to understand from reading the score. But you do have the advantage of, you know, at some point in the past, some player did have either what either the player was the composer, uh -huh. uh, and the composer passed it on. What I'm thinking of is something that happened with the Pro Arte Quartet, string quartet, when uh, we had an experience similar to what you and I have had, uh, f trying to pin down. Uh, articulation in the opening of a piece. I mean, it didn't take that long, but you know, one of them liked my marking, one didn't, and I'm saying, well, what marking do you want? And that they couldn't agree. Um, anyway, we, the truth is, it's about the sound. I was there, we figured it out easily. The next thing I know, they're playing the Brahms that they're going to play on the same concert, and there is that exact same way of using the bow. And I said, how did Brahms mark it? And they said, oh, there is no marking. I said, well, how did you decide to play it that way? And they said, we know this is how it goes. How do you know? They said, this is how it has come down from player to player. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So some of what you're doing in the older repertoire is not just you grappling with the score, but also knowing, it, being trained in a musical language, a real musical language, that has been passed on. That's right, there is a whole tradition yes. and a whole awareness of the style and the studying of it. That a dot in Beethoven may not be the same as a dot in Bach. That's right, that's right. And so they, at one point, and so then I, we went through this whole thing, it says, okay, what, what do you really mean? Okay, what does that mean? What does that mean? <laughs> okay, what does she want? <laughs> to, to the point where suddenly something clicks and this is what I want to do because this is what it says. And that's the major step that one takes uh, in learning of any piece, but especially with a piece like the commission work, uh, where there isn't sort of the tradition behind it yet because there are no recordings and nobody else has played it, obviously. <laughs> so, um, and that moment is like a light bulb just going off, mm -hmm. you know, in your, in your head. And it's so, so, it's such a wonderful, heartwarming, um, moment and until then you know it's like you're struggling okay mm -hmm. am i am i interpreting this right am i thinking that am i missing something did i you know overstep a line or you're thinking almost just analytically and then it becomes not just following the markings but music that just stirs the flow and that's a that's a that's a, a, a something that we have advantage mm -hmm. as a player as a performer 
um, that we have that I guess can't be experienced yeah, yeah. By, by somebody else. It's exciting to hear about the process. I really felt I learned something when we talked about this. And um, I just wanted to say that we know you you had requested a little time to warm up and so on. Is this a good spot for you to disappear, or do you have anything you'd like to say? It's a good place to disappear. <laughs> okay. <laughs> no, I mean, it's been, I'm very, very excited about the program. And um, just from the moment it starts, you know, it's just... Music kind of, at least for me, it just takes me to a different place, and it keeps taking me to different places. And and then, of course, to be able to do the premiere here, uh, your commission, McKim Fund, is it's such an important commission. And as I said, you know, I, I know quite a lot of pieces from it that I play. <laughs> uh, a lot of the American music that I play is from the McKim Fund, just coincidentally, but I mean, rightfully so. Yeah. And so to be a part of this and to be able to actually work with a composer like Tamara and, you know, just to give it its first breath um, is, we're always in the service of the composer, we're always in the service of um, the music, but to be in, you know, for this whole process as a player, um, I'm very, very happy, very grateful. So thank you. Wonderful. Thank you so much. You know, she was mentioning the McKim Fund, which those of you who have been in the audience for a long time have heard us talk about, and you've seen the roster of commissions and so on. And uh, what you may not have seen is that this year, Leonora Jackson McKim is on the front of our brochure. She will be on the front of our brochure, and she's on our website as the first figure. She's like an animating spirit this year. She was, if, if you've heard this already, you know, you can uh, stop me here, but she was a famous uh, woman who became a teenage superstar, very young at age 18. She went to Germany and played with um, Joachim as the conductor, Brahms's friend jo Joseph Joachim. Who and was also a violinist. Who was also, exactly. And he sort of mentored her and I, um, she, she suddenly hit a, a huge stardom, which in these days we are sort of were used to and were jaded by, but to be 18 years old and doing this in Europe as an American teenager was extraordinary. But our connection to her, and we didn't even really know so much about her until fairly recently because we have her collection, but it hadn't really been looked into so carefully. It had been, you know, processed, but had been sort of put away. There, if you have time, come by and check out some of the things sometimes because they're beautiful photographs, her own manuscripts, her own compositions, and so on. But just to, to mention what it is that we have, we have an endowment. She has now, her endowment has now made it possible for us to commission 89 works for violin and piano and Tamar's is the most recent of these 89 it's it's really it's really a remarkable document of violin playing in the 20th and 21st century so that gets us back to you and your your writing and some of the things we talked about yesterday and I wanted to ask you about some of these very technical terms like you said jab I love this word yeah that's really technical <laughs> We talked about the score, and it's so interesting when you look at the score, you see all the harmonics, and it's really a non-stop piece. Another technical term was you said the pianist part is feisty. I don't think I actually wrote that in the score, no. but it's true. <laughs> it's just a fun, fun concept. But what um, you were talking about, the sort of there's no pause that the two instrumentalists are going nonstop like a um, intense you know, whirlwind. Well, there are some sections where the energy is flowing in a, a different way. Uh, it's it's hard to describe because. Well, the title says something, Unruly Strands. Um, you're not going to hear themes, really, but you may remember bits. And the bits are different lengths and different kinds of gestures, and um, they get combined in different orderings and different mutant variations and so forth. And so if you can imagine a kind of a sketch or drawing where the line is, the width is changing and the direction is changing and then it turns into dots and you know, then it's kind of like this. 
this is what they're dealing with. But when you put it all together, it's yet a larger gesture, which ultimately becomes the form of the piece. So to get back to what you had asked about, yeah, there's a kind of volatility to all of that. But of course, part of it, there are bits of flow that are calmer, that mm -hmm. do feel different. You yeah. know, of course, they always have to be in the moment no matter what. And of course, she's talking about the sound. Well, the first thing that happens is they do radically different things. And Midori's thing is you may wonder when the sound will move on, in a sense. I'll leave it at that, whereas the piano does jab. Um, tell them about the title of your piece. That's so fascinating. Oh, well, um, you'll read about it in the notes, so I'm, I may not remember everything I said about it. Um, I mean, the word strands is connected just to the common meaning. Uh, you know, strands of thought or musical thought. Um, I'm also somebody who, kind of as a lay person, very interested in um, evolutionary biology, and I've read a lot of things about genetics and, and evolutionary biology, and uh, many of my pieces for the last few years uh, are connected to what I've learned about it. This piece is not as connected in terms of the actual processes in the piece, but um, the word strands, as you know, is also connected when we talk about DNA strands. Uh, so it has that association. And um, the last association that I'll mention is that, um, as I was telling Anne yesterday, at some point, after I'd written quite a bit of music, I was thinking about the qualities in the piece, and it's quite free. Certainly the form is not something you could pin down. And um, I was thinking uh, that, of course, Midori, like so many virtuoso violinists, is uh, well known for playing famous uh, caprichos. It's a genre of... Um, music that is very free and virtuosic, and there's a long violin tradition. And I thought, if, you know, would I call this piece some kind of capriccio? I don't know. I think I'm going to look up the word and um, read everything about it. And I love etymology. And I come across this information that they think the word came from a medieval um, Italian uh, word, capo, head, and riccio, which is like curly, bristly hair, like from a hedgehog. And I thought, that's it, unruly strands. <laughs> that is, you know, which is a the title I already had for my piece. And I thought, you know, I'll tell the audience, it's a kind of strange capriccio. <laughs> um, one of the things, we, we just have a little more time here, but I was remembering when we talked yesterday, we were touching on the question of, you know, the idea of women composer uh, festivals, women composer focuses in, in, in so forth and so on. And this is a, an interesting discussion that is ongoing and developing for young women who are composers, that's for sure. Um, it hasn't stopped, but you told me something you noted about Twyla Tharp, and I was wondering if you would what, talk, talk about that. Oh, I just happened to see her interviewed recently. Um, and the interviewer started, I, it, my memory is the interviewer started a question by saying something like, as one of the most prominent women choreographers, and she said, stop right there. <laughs> Meaning, why don't you just say, as one of the most prominent choreographers? And they went on and talked about that for a while. So all I can say is I relate to that. <laughs> And we were, um, you were also saying that for you, new music is so well suited to be being performed in other contexts, not to silo it or, or separate it and so well, on. Yeah, when we were talking about the whole women composer festival idea, whether it's a good idea or not, um, because of the sense of ghettoization, I just made the comment that I think new music from any kind of composer. I mean, new music as a, you know, music by living composers is ghettoized, except in the orchestra, 
uh, programming where there may not be enough of it, but when there's a new piece, you can bet it's usually not with the two other new pieces. Um, it's with older repertoire. And it's a great thing uh, because you hear both or however many eras of music, I think, in a much um, more interesting, deep way when you can hear from different eras in the same concert. And I like it in recitals. Um, you know, sometimes string quartets will do that as well. They'll play a Beethoven, they'll play a Brahms, they'll play a Schubert, um, they'll play an early 20th century work, and then they'll play something by a living composer, and it, it's wonderful. I was thinking about this comment uh, from Gubay Dulin, as she had said that people were asking her about being a woman composer in her career, and, and she said, uh, in Russia, women composers never complained about discrimination. It was equally miserable for everyone. Yeah. And the same for male composers now. It's not like they're getting tons of performances and women are getting none. And finally, I wanted to ask you, you have this interesting quote on your email uh, from Ali Akbar Khan, and you talk about, he, he mentions about real music as a kind of yoga. Why don't, why don't you read them the whole Okay. Uh, this, I just was caught by this when I saw her email. It says, our sages developed music from time immemorial for the mind to take shelter in that pure being which stands apart as one's true self. Real music is not for wealth, not for honors, nor even for the jo or not even for the joys of the mind. It is a kind of yoga, a path for realization and salvation to purify your mind and heart and give you longevity. Interesting. So why is well, I mean, I couldn't say it better. <laughs> <laughs> so, do you know? Do you like his music? I mean, are you a follower well, of his? He's an amazing his artist. Music, and he was one of the greatest musicians of our time, um, and I happened to go to what was billed as a farewell concert in Boston, and, and that quote was in the program for the, for the night, so that's where it came from. And so your music tonight is giving us longevity, among other things, <laughs> and uh, we're very, very excited to have you do this premiere for the Library of Congress. And you've had three commissions, actually, I should say. She's one of the few commissions, a few composers who's had three Library of Congress commissions, two were Kusevitsky commissions for string quartets, which are on display in our lobby. Um, so just before we break up, is there someone who has a question or, or two here? Nope. No questions? Well, anything else? I think we're I think we're good. I'm really pleased you could come tonight. This you are going to love the program and this new piece. So thank you so much. Thank you.